But if we sustain these tighter financial conditions, then the market is, is finally doing uh, the work of the Fed, and so it means the Fed doesn't have to do as much. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics as we are going to be digging back into the gold and silver markets today amidst what has become some carnage in the bond market that I think people are increasingly starting to notice more and more, creating perhaps what we could consider a bit of a feedback loop, which we will dig into today with my dear friend Steve Cope of Silver Viper, who has promised to come with all of the answers in making some sense out of the financial mess we're in that I guess in Washington circles, they still say everything is good to go and no, no, no signs for concern anywhere. Although, unfortunately, we're seeing things a little bit differently. So we'll point some of these out and give our take and you can make your own decisions at home. But Steve, great to have you back on here as always. And how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing all right, Chris. You know, again, since the last one, it's definitely been an interesting market. Um, a lot of different things happening around the world that should probably be affecting metals prices more than than's happening. But yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting time that we live in. Well, it certainly is. And speaking of the metals pricing, we are recording on Tuesday afternoon here, Eastern Time in the U.S. and Nice to see the silver price back over $22. Obviously, we've seen a bit of a sell-off over the past month, along with the surging interest rates, even after the Fed paused again at its last meeting. But we've seen longer-term rates start to go up quite a bit, which has put some pressure on the metals. Although, Steve, was pretty interesting. Somehow, in the midst of this, the turnaround came on Friday, shortly after the U.S. headline job number had a big increase, almost double the expectations, which normally would have accounted for a further sell-off in silver. Perhaps it was just overdone at that point, and we saw some short covering, yet uh, gone in the past month or so from about 24 down to 21, back up to 22. And any thoughts on the recent action over the past week, which at least has us a dollar higher off the lows? Yeah, I mean, obviously the hope is that this was all the final consolidation and enough's enough. I mean, we've talked about the jobs numbers in the past and yeah, they beat expectations every time and then readjust and turns there most of the time they were a miss. So I'll be curious to see what that one looks like when they review it, you know, <laughs> down the road. But Again, what are those jobs too? I mean, at some point the market figures out and realizes, you know, as you see layoffs by all the tech companies steadily that, you know, what jobs are being added and they're not jobs that are making people's livelihoods better. Yeah, that's certainly something we saw because as we dig into the labor report a little bit, we see that 885,000 full-time jobs lost, 1.127 million part-time jobs added. So Again, that's, if you look, I mean, that's look, the headline, right? That's great. So, and then the way the U.S. calculates a job report, so one of those full-time jobs takes three of those part-time jobs for the same person. They count as three people getting a job, and they're making less money than they were in their full-time job. That's not healthy. <laughs> yeah, certainly paints a different light on the picture of what we're hearing out of the government. Joe Biden was out on Friday talking about the great labor report. It was actually interesting. He had another note in there where he said that inflation has come down and it's only been 2.2% over the last three months. And I was, I was first, I was thinking, uh, where is he getting these numbers from? Although perhaps he meant that literally that it was 2.2% over just three months and annualized that brings us to about 9% on the year. I'm guessing you have not been feeling the effects of a lowered inflation rate based on what you and most other people in the planet are actually experiencing so far? No, it's definitely getting worse and worse month by month and the pressure that are on people, uh, you know, and, and what it's done with mortgage rates. And as, you know, especially here in Canada as people's, you know, because we have to turn over our rates and sooner. I mean, what's going to happen here over the next couple of years is people's mortgages come up and they get the sticker shock of, much higher payments and, and interest rates it's it's going to be you know really tough on our economy and i imagine it's going to affect the us at the same time as well 
Well, speaking of which was interesting because this morning there was another story out as the National Association of Home Builders, as well as the Mortgage Bankers Association, National Association of Realtors, they wrote a letter to Powell asking him to stop raising interest rates or risk an economic hard landing. Obviously, we've seen a lot of activity slow down in the housing market. Prices have not really come down here in the U.S. yet, although while we're, we're, we're given reports that the housing market is still doing well. Interesting to see that they're claiming if we get further interest rates, interest rate hikes, that we're really at the risk of a hard landing, which I suppose is just the latest factor weighing on these things. And um, what, what else are you going to expect when you have mortgage rates near 8%? with uh, housing being such a large portion of the economy right yeah no for sure and it, and it, how heavily the banks across our country across the u.s are all you know their exposure to that it's you know these banks are already failing based on on these interest rate hikes and the pressure that's put on them and now you start to look at balance sheets and and various things and you start seeing you know banks like the bank of america losing a hundred billion dollars and various uncertain aspects and these aren't little hits anymore these banks they're hurting and they're getting they're getting hammered with what's going on so again i don't think it's sustainable i don't think the fed can do many more i mean everyone expects one more rate hike here but i just i it's got to stop there's just way too much pressure this is putting not only on you know the average joe it's putting pressure on the powers that be that run these banks too. <laughs> yeah, because certainly with the higher rates, we've seen deposits leaving. We have concerns about commercial real estate. Now, even some of the the uh, housing authorities or, or trade groups rather concerned about what we're seeing in the the uh, residential side. So. Obviously, when we saw some of the banks go down earlier this year, of which a lot of those concerns haven't gone away. I, I mean, the solution to that was the bank, the Fed's bank term funding program, which essentially is could be looked at as more quantitative easing. So fortunately, we well, that part was not fortunate, although, again, when that happened back in March and April, did once again see the response out of gold and silver, which has died down a little bit since then although it has not gone away. And uh, something that I did find interesting is that as the longer term rates have gone up, starting to hear talk of whether perhaps the Fed will actually get that last interest rate hike or if they are done. Here's an interesting one I wanted to play for you. This is Nick Timrose of the Wall Street Journal, who affectionately known as the Fed Whisperer, as he seems to get insight into some of the Fed. We, we can usually find out what's coming at the Fed meeting by reading his columns a month or so in advance. And here he was talking about this on CNBC. So play a minute of this and then get your thoughts on that one. Would they step in or I guess, does it at least mean that they're not going to hike rates again? They don't have to do that because the work's already yes. been done. <laughs> That's so, just it. So, yeah. So, you know, the case for a November rate increase is going down because you've gone up 50 basis points in the 10 year Treasury in the last month. Uh, you've gone up almost a point since the last rate increase in July. And so the case for raising rates in November, it, it already seemed pretty weak. I mean, Powell at the last press conference two weeks ago saying proceed carefully six times. And December's still a long time away. There's still more data to come out. But if we sustain these tighter financial conditions, then the market is, is finally doing uh, the work of the Fed. And so it means the Fed doesn't have to do as much. So there you hear it from Nick Timoros. A few other data points we got out. Here was the Fed's Bostic, Raphael Bostic from the Atlanta Fed. Sees no more U.S. rate hikes. And also along with that, we had... President Lori Logan indicating rising treasury yields could steer the Fed from further rate increases. So it seems like Nick is not alone in, in saying that. I know you've you've been an advocate that they've raised rates plenty uh, quickly enough. Certainly it's had its impact. And do you think that we could finally be nearing the end here? Well, I've, I've yeah, I mean, again, I feel like we should, we should have been nearing the end a year ago, but um I get. I mean, I think we've been cautiously coming into November, and I think if they don't raise, 
raise rates in November now, I think you're going to see gold and silver take a massive jump. I mean, that still to the market would be an unexpected move. I think that would trigger a very large step up um, in metals prices. And with then the expectation that the people will be watching and definitely looking for the Fed to lower rates at some point next year. Um, I Yeah, I think that would be massive. If we didn't have a rate hike in November, you would see a, a major turnaround and money start to come back into the space. Yeah, well, fortunately, you may be in luck, Steve, because as we look at the probabilities for the November meeting, up to 88% for no hike versus 12% for another quarter point. And this was interesting, looking a little farther out, the probabilities of further pausing and no hike before cutting have gone up quite a bit. This was lower around 40 or 50%, but this is the what the futures market is pricing in. And they currently have one, two, three, four cuts priced in for next year, which would be ahead of the Fed schedule. Although showing that I think the market is becoming increasingly concerned with some of the conditions you've been describing. Also, uh, what, what I started talking about earlier this year, how you have debt interest expense rising, deficits rising, and all creating a feedback loop, which how does this all affect uh, gold and silver, as you mentioned? I think it's pretty reasonable that we would see some movement in gold and silver just on the announcement alone that they're done hiking. Now, it's been a couple of meetings since they've hiked. And so far, though, they've talked about the increased probability of another hike yet. Sounds like you think that once we get an official pause, let alone uh, uh, cuts, so perhaps two drivers that really could start freeing the metals, especially given what else could be happening with banking in between now and then. Yeah. Well, and then and then the springboard on that is you start lowering interest rates and then you should see the equity start to go up as well. I mean, that's been the disconnect throughout all of this is there's been such a sell off of those paper assets just because people were hurting the funds, you know, getting no inflows. If you're talking about, you know, people that were borrowing money to invest and all of a sudden, you know, their equities were going down in value while their interest was going up, they were forced to sell rapidly. So you start to lower those interest rates and make it more, you know, incentivize people to be investing again and make that money cheaper. And and again, you're going to see the equities really rebound quickly and they'll outperform gold and silver dramatically on, on the way up. Yeah, and certainly on the junior mining side has not been the easiest time period over the <laughs> past year and a half. I think we've finally hit the bottom outside of uh, another big drop in the silver price on the mining equity side. Yeah, I mean, even I think even if silver fell off, I don't think that's going to trigger people selling out of these equities now. They've been so beat up. We might, you know, potentially some companies could see a bit of tax loss selling in December um, for the ones that were able to raise capital and are trading below those, you know, what they did their raises at. But we, we were pretty heavily sold off last year for tax loss selling season as well. So again, I don't think it would be as big as last year's. Um, but beyond that, I mean, again, I think we're very close so like I said, that to me, a pause in rates will instantly trigger a rebound in the equities. And when I say equities, I mean our junior equity space that's been so beat up. I mean, it'll help the blue chips to some level too, but they're not as in they're not in as dire straits as what we've been in in our sector here for really two years on a macro scale of a lot of pain. Yeah, and add into that if we do experience a recession, which it's actually an interesting one to think about because we get positive GDP numbers in the U.S., although what is a big part of that GDP is the government spending. So yeah, you, you have that boosting things, creating a bigger deficit, telling us GDP is positive. Um, although, Steve, back to the silver side here. This uh, was something Tavi Costa posted recently, mentioned on the show before, but this is Mexico silver production where... We've seen a drop throughout 2023. Now, the increase in the drop, this is along the time when the Penasquito, Newmont's Penasquito mine was shut down, which fortunately finally got back into production last week. But I know you were talking about conditions in Mexico on a great webinar you did with Red Cloud Securities, which I will link to the end of this video so people can 
take a listen to that. You had some good comments and I was wondering if you could just update people on what you're seeing in the conditions in Mexico and any thoughts on this drop and what you might be expecting going forward. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, yeah, being, being I mean, Penasquito is the largest mine in Mexico with silver as a byproduct and a large byproduct. So, that, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's definitely a major one that affected those numbers. But you just recently, this last week, actually had Pan American, their mine got robbed in Zacatecas. And they've now said, you know, what do they, they need the government to step in there on the La Colorado mine. So yeah. that's going to affect silver production too um, in the country. And the main thing though, I mean, and the main reason beyond Penasquito is, is the market conditions that we've been, in. you know, you've got reserves that are depleting in these mines and they're not being replaced by new projects because you know, the, the miners aren't funding the juniors to explore. The juniors aren't getting funded by the, you know, the funds to explore because they have no money right now. So it's kind of grinding the, the, the whole way the system's supposed to work, you know, to a halt right now. Um, you're going to, it'll, I mean, obviously that's going to turn. That'll turn and, and move up. And politically, it looks like Mexico's trending in the right direction towards this next election, that it should start to free up and make things better for the mining industry down there as well. But yeah, it's 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 just been tough. I mean, again, these interest rates and how it affects inflation and the costs for everyone. And then on top of that, you have depleting equities. And that's how, you know, the juniors that are either trying to become producers or are, you know, building up resources to sell to the producers. And they haven't been able to do a lot of work over the last year. So again, you're not seeing new mines come online for the most part. And you're, you're got depleting production at the mines. And then you mix in some, you know, certain jurisdictions in Mexico where it's not as safe to work. And you have issues, you know, like you see at, at you know, in Zacatecas and further south into Mexico where it's really making work hard. Yeah, and it's certainly going to be interesting to see when we get next year's uh, Silver Institute numbers, where, as we've talked about before, had about a 240 million ounce deficit, which has not been helped this year because obviously we had some of these shutdowns in Mexico. And at the same time, at least talking with Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin, especially due to the surge they saw in the in the buying back in March and April, their sales numbers ahead of what they saw in 2022. Meanwhile, out of China, we continue to see increased solar production. And perhaps one last note to run by you here is that China, where obviously they've had a slowdown in their economy, concerns in their real estate market, and at least they are considering stimulus. Uh, I don't think it'd be a shock to anyone if we get more easing out of China, which perhaps would put another floor under concerns of whether China is going to slow down and slow down with their silver consumption. Um, and again, something that we're probably going to see not too far off, not just out of China, but a variety of the different government groups. We've gone through the tough part of the hiking cycle. And, you know, we, we've been talking all throughout this call about what we expect out of the Fed in the U.S., but China and other places probably not too far off from putting more credit into the market, which is another factor that should be supportive of silver. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, I mean, again, that's that's the biggest thing with silver this go around. When we compare when silver, you know, hit 50 in the past twice, now all of a sudden it's this industrial side of silver that just gives it that extra massive boost coming in, you know, to this cycle of when it's going to run and when it's going to go because of, I mean, we've, you hear it from every speaker, but we talk about, you know, all these new uses and this green movement, whether it's solar or electric cars and the infrastructure and everything built around those on top of all the health stuff. It's, it's got all these new uses that it never had in the past. You know, in the past it was photography, it was in film and, and the industrial side was negligent compared to, you know, the rest of the 99% of the market for silver, which was tied to gold and was just, you know, all about hedging currency and, and everything on that side. Now it's, it's got this industrial side that's just going to drive that deficit further. And, and in the past, you didn't have the deficit. You know, you had lots of silver that was found, lots of mines going into production. And, you know, we kept, we were building up a surplus year over year over year because the, you know, the silver itself wasn't being used or it was, you know, and what was being bought was being stacked and still sitting in physical somewhere. But 
No, I'm. That's what makes me so excited for this cycle this time around is when it does finally take off, and you realize, you know, there's not enough silver to support everything. You know, to to start doing more solar, replace these solar panels as they fail, and you can't recycle the silver. You know, replace the infrastructure and the wire, like every little electrical component that needs that silver in it, and you don't have the silver, and it's harder and harder to find. So, you know, the only choice you have is for that price to go up dramatically to bring on, you know, assets that aren't economic at these prices and not even close. And you're going to need a, a dramatically higher number to do that. And then even then you're still going to, you know, not have enough assets to replace the silver and produce the silver that's needed. So I'm, I'm really excited when it does turn and we all just have to be patient and grind out and watch the Fed and, and hope that, it, you know, this November is the turn. Yeah, and especially when you think about it, I mean, we were back up at $26 in uh, February of 2022, then had that drop down to below 18 bucks later that year and had some spikes earlier this year, but has really been going on a year and a half now, these conditions where at points, the price of silver going below the cost of production for many companies and has really hurt the market. So a little bit of a gap going there in terms of bringing new production online, which is especially if we do see a surge in investment demand going to leave us with an interesting market, which you would think would result in some higher prices at some point. So we'll certainly be keeping an eye on that. And although Steve, again, you're one of the people that we're counting on to help fund that gap and, Perhaps you could give us an update. I know you're getting excited to start drilling again in a short period of time there, testing El Ruby at depth and also looking for a new discovery at El Molino. And maybe you could catch us up to speed on drilling program when you're getting started and how things are looking there. Yeah, no, we're really excited for that drilling program, you know, to one, just to beef up, to set in for a new resource that we plan to come out with next year, an update on our maiden resource. You know, targeting having, you know, over 1 million ounces of gold equivalent in that new resource, um, which would be, you know, over 70 million ounces of silver equivalent. And our, our project's only gold and silver. There's no base metals included in any of that. So really excited on, you know, seeing in El Ruby producing some of the numbers that it's been able to produce in the past with, you know, kilogram plus silver and high grade gold. And then if we can make a new discovery on, you know, any one of the, you know, kind of dozens of targets around the project, but like you, you mentioned El Molino, and that's definitely our number one target to make a new discovery right now. We've, we've identified a zone there that's got the same breach of structures coming up to surface, which is our high grade structure. And we see them in sequence and in parallel and coming together, you know, in that area. So I know the geology team is really excited about that and, and planning on hitting that here in the next month or two months to get that drilling program going. So It'll be a 5,000 meter program split between El Ruby doing some resource definition there, testing it at depth, and then moving over to El Molino. Um, yeah, I mean, again, new discoveries always drive share prices. And if we can make a new discovery in a market where metals prices are turning and moving up, then, then our investors would be really in for a lot of fun because that's a share price that is so beat up right now that it should rebound regardless of any sort of good results. Never mind if we can start, you know, making new discoveries or growing that El Ruby part of the deposit. You know, I'm, I think there are really good things on the horizon for Silver Viper. Yeah. And in addition to that, you've been getting some higher grades than what's typically found in that area. And perhaps you could talk about that a little bit. What, what you guys have seen so far versus the average in the Sonora state. Yeah. The state, the state is known for its open pit heap leach mining, which is, you know, more about gold and the gold content in most of them. And so we, like I said, our resource is 60% gold, 40% silver, but our metallurgy shows that will that silver will leach at a fairly high percentage as well. So it's an important component to what we what we envision here. And that's the the project starting as an open pit heap leach operation before going underground. But the average open pit, you know, I rewind for a second there. The you know, investors are taught grade, 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 look for high grade, look for high grade. And I agree. But when you do that, you have to understand what you're comparing to. And so the average open pit heat leach operation in the state of Sonora operates about a half gram gold average grade. You know, and when you look at our, the resource we've already put out at La Virginia, we've got, depending on the resource category, 0 0.8 grams, 0 0.9 grams gold. And then we've got another half gram gold equivalent in silver on top of that. And so 
that now you start looking in, you know, compared to the average operation in the state of Sonora, we're about double to triple the average grade, you know, where we're at right now in the resource. So that's a fantastic start and really sets the deposit, you know, apart from a lot of our peer companies. Now for us, it's a question of how big can we make it? You know, what mining company are we going to be looking, what size mining company are we going to be looking to sell this to? when we deem the time is right. You know, a lot of those open pity bleach operations started at about a half million ounces of gold equivalent. Well, we're already past that threshold. We're at 700,000 right now on an equivalent basis. So that would apply, you know, to the smaller junior producer, but our model and what the potential that we see, we can see this becoming a multi-million ounce gold, you know, deposit. Again, split between gold and silver on an equivalent basis. So it's going to produce gold, it's going to produce silver on that and that in itself, you know, lends us and exposes us to majors on both sides, you know, wanting to be interested in looking at our project and following, you know, our progress as we go along. But, you know, again, I, this, I don't think to me, this, the question is, is will this deposit be a mine? It's just how big will the mine be ultimately on the, on the project? Well, it's going to be good to have you guys out there drilling and find out more about that. Any, any, uh, timeline just yet on when you'll know more about the results there from the next program yeah we're still monitoring the market and and working with our team down there in the drilling companies trying to pinpoint exactly when we want to fire up that program but i would expect it to come fairly soon um from that i mean i haven't we haven't been getting assays from the lab recently but i don't think there's a ton of work happening in mexico right now so i would expect that the turnaround times are should be on the quicker end at the assay labs um so we'll wait and see on that but yeah once we start the program i would expect to have you know the first results coming out about a, probably a month later okay well i know a lot of people are going to be looking forward to that and it's good to see that you're growing the resource in time when we're in a little bit of a down market and hopefully we'll line up quite nicely with some improved market conditions steve can you let folks know if they have questions want to stay posted on your progress there best way to do so yeah, all the information's on the website. You can see there, silverviperminerals.com. You can email us at info at silverviperminerals.com and that comes to Alicia or myself. More than happy to you know reach out. There's phone numbers there on the website as well that you can reach out and give us a call and and touch base. Um, yeah, anyway, it's a it's a great story. And if you want to hear more about it, please feel free to to reach out. Well, I appreciate that. And also, if people at home, you'd like to hear more about it, have a the video that Steve did with Red Cloud coming your way, which is linked at the end of this one. So just click on that. You can find out more about the success and progress of the project. And that one's coming your way now.